<laughs> Welcome to our humble home. Uh, tonight, we get the great privilege uh, to host uh, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Awards West Coast Celebration and Discussion. You know, we, we believe in the Cooper Hewitt so much. They love design. They love to teach, and they love to learn. And if I can in, uh, teach my own people anything, it would be to, to, to uh, believe in those things among all others. We are aligned in, in our beliefs and what we try to do every single day. Uh, you are lucky tonight to have Caroline Bauman here to uh, welcome our guests and be your real host tonight. I'm just kind of the stand-in. Uh, so with that, I give you to Caroline Bowman. So wonderful to see all of you. Good evening. And John and I actually have a tradition, which is I put him on the spot every year and say, we're doing this again next year, right, John? <laughs> OK. That's how we gain sponsors at, at Cooper Hewitt. So I wanted to open by telling you a little bit about the last six weeks at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. As you know, we are part of the magnificent family of Smithsonian museums. And in mid-December, I think it was December 15th, we opened a show on the third floor of the museum entitled The Road Ahead really emphasizing the role of design in our future cities and moving people, services, goods. Days later, the government shuts down. So I am not going to go down the negative road tonight and tell you about all the ramifications of the shutdown, but rather focus on the positive, which lies in the Cooper Hewitt Dream Team. We are a medium-sized museum of 90 people, and boy, is it ever a family. So the government shuts down, and the staff that could work, that was teleworking, met in living rooms, in my living room, at Pan Quotidien, even at a church that's next door to Cooper Hewitt. That is dedication to design, as I look at Rupi Ravakumar. <laughs> So I would really like to acknowledge the team members that are here tonight. Can you all raise your hands, please, Cooper Hewitt staff? So here we were shut down, but what were they doing? They were planning this week on the West Coast. So they've already been in LA. They're now in San Francisco, obviously, and we go to Seattle tomorrow. So thank you, all of you, for your dedica dedication and very hard work. I would also like to acknowledge two Cooper Hewitt board members that are with us tonight, Margaret Stewart and Shelby Gans. The Cooper Hewitt board is 34 people that are incredibly involved with everything that we do and the direction that we're going. So I really want to thank both of you. And obviously they're very involved since Margaret is our moderator. The other thing that we were doing during the shutdown, believe it or not, was landing the first design exhibition at the World Economic Forum in Davos. So a few of us were in Switzerland with a selection of projects from our Access Plus Ability exhibition. And I cannot tell you how proud I am that leaders of countries would come out of these sessions and see the powerful design objects designed by and for people with disabilities. And one of the 20 projects is in your backyard in Palo Alto, the wonderful Imagination Playground. And we actually brought the piece that is um, a chandelier harp with 24 lasers. And as people walk underneath it, music is produced. And it's been shown and proven that kids with autism are developing much faster when they have this music musical experience and this community experience. So know that Palo Alto was part of our show. Um, design, of course, is Cooper Hewitt. Um, and we're really thrilled to be taking the National Design Awards on the road. This is the third year 
um, in San Francisco, and the crowd grows every year, uh, as does our itinerary. So this year, we're going to Detroit. We have been in Boston and LA, as I mentioned, and Seattle. So it continues to grow and grow and grow. Thank you to many of our winners who spent considerable time in the San Francisco school system over the last few days. Um, I was particularly moved in the Prescott School in Oakland um, two days ago, which was just incredible, where we worked with the kids on protest posters um, and learning about a career in graphic design and that they too can be graphic designers. Um, so really, really powerful programming. Believe it or not, the National De Design Awards will be 20 years old this October, so I hope many of you can join us for the gala celebration on October 70th, 70th, 17th. <laughs> New calendar at Cooper Hewitt. Um, and the exciting element of this year's National Design Awards is we will have an emerging designer award category um, that will have a cash prize, and it's the very first year. So I see many potential emerging designers in the crowd. Um, please remember for next year um, to draw attention to your projects and, and let us know. So with that, I want to pass the mic to Margaret Stewart, who has been on the board for two years. And she is the youngest of nine children. So really knows how to handle a conversation or a conflict or <laughs> anything else. Uh, the other thing I love, well, I love a lot of things about Margaret, but every Halloween, she dresses up as Ruth Bader herself, Ginsburg. <laughs> um, so she is one of a kind. Um, so we're really, really happy to honor the National Design Award winners and have Margaret leading us tonight. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Caroline. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be with this wonderful group of uh, designers and design leaders and National Design Award winners. Um, we have so many interesting things to talk about, but I think what would be great is to start by having everyone introduce themselves, um, talk about the you know, high level, the work that they do, and then maybe a little bit of the journey that got you into design in the first place. I think it's always really interesting to hear how people end up in this really diverse and, and interesting, uh, you know, kind of thing that we call design. Yeah. So let's me? kick it off. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Gail Anderson, and I came in from New York for this. Um, and I went to the School of Visual Arts based on a poster uh, that I saw in um, my art room at Cardinal Spellman High School in the Bronx, uh, Paul Davis, SBA poster, to be good is not enough when you dream of being great. And I was like, I'm going there. And I, I was like, they get me. And I, I picked my college based on a poster, which I don't recommend in general, but, but it worked. So um, I am a graduate. I, I taught there uh, for almost probably 30 years, one class at a time over the years. Um, and uh, I'm the creative director at the school at Visual Arts Press. Um, and before that was at a company called Spotco designing theater posters and campaigns. And I was at Rolling Stone for many years before that. But, but my, my journey was all about <laughs> wanting to make um, Partridge Family magazines and Jackson 5 magazines. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had my scrapbook. And it's like, how do you get to do that for a living? And through SVA and a book that was in our classroom um, about careers in commercial art, which was what it was called then, I, I thought this is what I want to do and ended up getting to do, well, I got to meet David Cassidy <laughs> in the end. And, but uh, I've been very fortunate to have gotten to do a lot of fun things over the years. So. So go into design. You can meet David Cassidy. Yeah. <laughs> not anymore. Not, not anymore. I know. No, too soon. May you rest in peace. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oops. Michael, tell uh, us more. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Michael Ellsworth. I uh, got my start because I like to go to parties and I like to throw parties. So I would throw parties, and parties needed posters and flyers and. And that's how I got into it. And um, it was like, come see my terrible band play. And uh, people came because the posters are good. 
Um, so, so years <laughs> was later. Was the music good? No. No, the music no. was terrible. Uh, Will you sing a little something? Yeah. Or, Go for no, it, no, Michael. I was a singer. I was a guitar. I was just like a really bad guitar player. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, but I kept going with that and promoting things. And um, after a couple failed design studios, and now have a design practice in uh, Seattle, Washington called um, Civilization. And we're a team of nine people, and uh, we throw a lot of events <laughs> along with the studio uh, that we run. Um, and I still get to make posters and in, invite people to come to parties. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Um, my name is Liz Gerber, and uh, about 20 years ago, I was working right down the street off of Market Street, and I was doing, I was hanging out with some kids in the Tenderloin. We were doing some research and it was like research meets um, education. Uh, I was working at a toy company and we we're trying to understand what kids like to play with. And, um, but the way we were doing it was actually by teaching them about product design um, and hearing their ideas and hearing what they like to do. And I was hanging out with eight, you know, eight to 10 year olds and hearing about their visions for what was fun. And anything was possible for them eight to 10, and I was so excited that anything was possible for them and their imagination. I also was so intrigued by the fact that we could both be doing research and understanding these kids and also be teaching them at the same time. So the organization that um, my students and I started was called, is called Design for America, and um, it's a national network of students working throughout the country, working on projects that they're passionate and that they care about. And so it was a real commentary on um, wanting a national design core, um, wanting to teach all students and kids design, and um, wanting to people to work in their local community in a way was, that was impactful. So. The Tenderloin, starting off with the kids in the Tenderloin is, uh, is where I got my start. So um, I'm gonna try to facilitate this conversation. We'll try to, to make it flow pretty organically. And if you all also wanna ask each other questions, that's cool too. Um, I think that, uh, how many students do we have in the audience today? We have a decent number of students. Okay, cool, welcome. It's wonderful that you're here. Um, I'm curious because I think that it's always interesting whether um, you know, you're a designer or an aspiring designer or somebody who loves design. I bet like, almost everyone here at least falls in one of those categories. What is your day-to-day -day like? Um, how do you, you know, what's, a, what's, a, what's a typical day for you? So I wake up with an eight-year-old jumping on my head um, <laughs> and a dog that needs to be walked. Um, I'm a mother of two children. Uh, after I do hours of getting them ready, which feels, it feels like hours, it's actually not hours. Um, I show up at my, my paid job. And, um, which, which is, and maybe you can... Which is, oh, so I'm, I, um, I work with an incredible team that runs Design for America. Our executive director is right up here, Rebecca Brewer. Um, she does the day-to-day -day of Design for America, and I am um, a design uh, instructor and faculty at Northwestern University. So I run a research lab. I usually meet up with my students. We talk about, our research actually is around how to organize large groups of people. So it's very related to Design for America, which is a large group of people, um, and how to empower large groups of people. So I meet with them, and um, Rebecca and I will have a meeting about everything brilliant that she's cooked up. And um, I try and say yes as much as possible, or let's try it. And then, um, and then I usually give a lecture or two that's significantly boring, and I'm behind a podium, um, and then, I go home. How, how do you carve out... And then the eight-year-old jumps on me again. Okay. It's like a very... And the, and the dog, yeah. How do you carve out the thinking time? Uh, that's so hard oh, to... Gail. Is it like when you're driving or when you're... Uh, so you know? I, I hate commuting, so I don't drive. Um, so I schedule it. It's so embarrassing. I literally have, like, think time on my calendar. How much time? Uh, I try and get an hour a day. I, do, I usually get one second, but I try. Do you have like a special place for the thinking? You know, it, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm really struggling right now with digital versus, with, versus analog, and analog. I feel like I get on my computer and I get, way, I get late, like distracted. So I'm working on getting back to analog. And you? It's all about the notebook, about the right notebook, yeah. and the right pen. Right, and the right pen. Who totally. here's really picky about their notebooks and pens? All of us yeah, designers. No. This yeah. is like Nerdville right here. Yes, exactly. What yes. pen do you use? Because that's really why people came well, to this. 
funny you, you ask. should ask. That's why I have uh, what is it? Oh, she has it in her pocket. Oh, I love it. Um, Gail, you're the... Whoa. A barren fig uh, pen. Uh, I have several colors and several different leather sleeves for them. Uh, and I, I know, it's, it's, yeah. You let me test drive it. I, I let him test drive it. And when he was done, I was like, what do you think? You must be really good <laughs> yeah, friends. Actually, yeah. really nice. during yeah, this well, panel. You, you said it drives nicely? It drives nicely. Yeah, it drives good nicely. Flow. Yeah, good flow. Gail, may I? Just during the panel? Please. So yeah, Okay, thanks. Yeah. I'll tell you what it's like. Uh, so in the meantime, Michael, you want to talk a little bit about your day today? Yeah. We could go deep on pens, but. I also wake up to a child on my face, um, <laughs> a four-year-old. Uh, no, I get, I get to the studio, I try to get there early for my think time. I try to beat everybody there. Um, and I have this little ritual where I turn all the lights on and like um, do the things, like the housekeeping, but I think while I'm doing that, and like figure out my day. And then I usually write tons of lists and then Wait, you do what? Bullet journaling now? Bullet journaling, yeah. <laughs> Chicken scratch bullet journaling. Just like get it all down. What do I what do I need to do today? Um, and then I just I'm in meetings like most of the day and I try not to be on my phone or try not to email all the time. I like try to just be like in the moment and present with their team or with clients or um, and then I'll take an hour to like email and work on all that stuff. But when do you do your creative work? Always. It's like, all. Oh. I feel it's always. I feel like the best creativity comes when you're like in the moment with someone and you're brainstorming something, like oh. listening to a client, like how do we solve this problem or what is this problem or what are the opportunities? So I try to just be kind of clear-headed when we're mm -hmm. in there and kind of in a state of flow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I've noticed like not having my phone around and yeah, not. Totally. Yeah. Just being disconnected. So are we allowed to connected. say that in the Bay Area? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Very important. New, New York and yeah. Seattle. I give me the pen. Okay. Oh, I'm giving, <laughs> okay. I'm giving the pen. This is like slipping it in her time. pocket. Nobody's <laughs> noticing. No. It's very nice. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Very so nice. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about because I think in in different ways each of you has had you know um, a, a big part of your practice as design is service whether it's in teaching or in the work that you do in education and social change. Again, teaching, but your entire organization is about empowering people to engage in design. And so I'm curious how you feel it, the role of design and designers may be changing and evolving, if at all, if it's always been that way, or if there's real change in response to you know, this really interesting, turbulent times that we're living in and this sense that people you know, want to see change happen, and, and what role can and should designers play that responsible, the professional responsibility that they need to bring to their craft? I mean, oh. designers uh, starting out, students here are so lucky because there's so much you can do. There's so many jobs. There's so many opportunities uh, to 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 do good, to just to do, and where. People know what we do now in a way that they didn't, I mean, not really, but, but better than they did when I was your age. Um, so we have a seat at the table, you know? And that's so, it's just an amazing time to, to be starting out in this profession. Just okay. as an aside. So I, I love that answer, and this is when I feel a little uncomfortable because I have a very broad view of design. Um, I want designers in Congress. I want them in hospitals. I want them in uh, everywhere. Um, I'm so proud. Can we just have a, can I do this? Can I get a round of applause for the number of women we have in Congress right now? I'm so excited about that. So I... You know, 20 years from now, I want to be saying we have the most number of designers we've ever had in Congress because I think design and the design, the approach we take to design um, and thinking about problem solving is so incredibly important. And I'm pretty sure the world would be better off if many people understood and embraced design. So everyone, maybe, is my answer. Yeah. The world. Yeah. And go ahead. yeah, I think that um, it's a. Gr Oh, sorry. Uh, Ice cream cone. Ice cream Thank cone. Thank you. I think that it's an interesting time in general, this time of flux and this time of uncertainty.
But I think as designers, we're basically making decisions. Everything we do is a, is a series of decisions. So how we work in the studio and how I like to think about design is that those decisions can be informed by empathy, sustainability, and meaning. So it's when you're thinking about these things through those lenses, like thinking about inequality, thinking about marginalized voices, thinking about how to fight against tyranny, think about all of the things that your actions and the consequences of those actions will lead to. And sustainability doesn't necessarily have to be environmental sustainability. Think about something making it to last for as long as it can, even if it's a piece of print ephemera. Think of something that people want to hold on to and put in their cubicle or hang on their wall. Um, and meaning it's just being honest and trying to tell the real story and be as truthful as possible in this kind of post-truth era we're living in. Um, so that's where I see design. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think about any of that starting out. I just, you know, wanted to make my Partridge Family magazines, and uh, and. The, <laughs> Me too. I just and we to love you because yeah, of that. Yeah, and so, so the opportunity to, to have such an impact as a designer is, is incredible. So. You touched a little bit on this with some kind of like specific examples of what that um, social impact can look like. What are some other examples or you know, people or particular um, you know, work that you are admiring right now, or even historical work, because it's not like this idea of, you know, design as a positive, uh, you know, agent for uh, social change is completely new. We may be more aware of it, but just curious what, um, what designers or particular works inspire you in that space. Well, we're, like, design history is so fundamental to our practice, and we do a lot of curation around that and a lot of programming around that. But we have our heroes throughout history, and it's like Grand Fury, um, whose Silence Equals Death campaign that really made a difference. It literally saved lives. Um, people like Tibor Coleman in Colors Magazine, um, people like Ken Garland in the First Things First Manifesto. Like these aren't new things, but these principles can be applied. Uh, They're still as relevant today as they were then. You know. Yeah, Black Tibor. Panther newspaper. Tibor Amazing. stuff was the aha moment for me when I was younger. Why, why was that? Just, it was so smart. And it, it, it was more than just something cool, yeah. you know? But it still was something cool. It was the anti-fashion fashion magazine. There you go. Like, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible. And taking, like, this brand and using that resource and that, that distribution channel to, like, impact people on a real real way, real connected way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out two um, designers who are very different kind of designers. One is Eve Ewing, who's a, um, I don't even know if she'd call herself a designer. She's in Chicago, and she is writing the first Marvel comic about an African-American female lead character. And the, I, I was speaking with her last weekend about how she's thinking about this character and developing this character and writing the story about her and what she does and um, her powers. And I was blown away by a story she said. Um, she said, she said, you know, I, I don't mean to sound this, say this lightly, but she said, before I started writing this comic, she's, she's a writer, she does quite a bit of work. She said, I never received death threats. I only started receiving death threats once I started writing this comic. And she said, and she said that was uncomfortable. Um, and, her, and her colleague said, well, that's because you're a threat. And she, and she said, she really thought about what it meant, what that meant, and she said, yeah, you know what, she's right. I'm a threat because I am defining who the new superhero is for the next generation. And I'm defining in my, in my understanding of, of this. Um, it, and I just, I was, I was so inspired by the care and the thought in which she is giving to designing this character. So that's e-viewing. Can I throw out another one? Please do. Okay. Susie Wise um, is over in Oakland, and she is reconceiving schools, public schools in Oakland, using a design approach. And she's not just doing elementary schools, she's doing high schools. She's rethinking how the community works together, and I think as a community designer and a service designer, she gets the big picture, which I think is the real... Um, is so needed right now, is somebody who thinks systemically and thinks about how the neighborhood interact and how the 
politic, uh, politicians interact. And I'm blown away by the work she's doing. She started a school called Urban Montessori um, over there that if you get a chance to check it out, it, it's phenomenal, very phenomenal. Where is this? Over in Oakland, Urban Montessori is what it's called. And I'm blown away by the work she's doing. Yeah, um, so I'm, I would love, because you know, we spent a little bit of time up front talking about the work that you do, but I'm really interested to hear, you know, ideally from each of you, what are the things that you're working on right now that you are most excited about? And, you know, uh, you know in the space of, um, you know, social impact or not, um, just really curious to hear what's energizing right, you right now, what's inspiring you in terms of the work you're doing. Um, I'm working on, uh, I've worked on a bunch of books over the years with Steve Heller, and um, we started one, and I kept sort of making false starts, and now I'm obsessed with it, a book called Type Speaks, um, about just another type book, that it'll, for me, another type book, but um, it's about expressive type, and we spent the day yesterday at the Letterform Archive. OMG. Oh who has, who, right, I want a show of hands. Who has not been? I'm going to embarrass you. Okay, go. Really? Like, Ron, leave the session. Go. Yeah, go now. Okay, yeah. go now. I, I'm sorry, Carolyn. That's the shame portion of the panel. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I, am, I am a professor. So. And that just, you know, that just got me so jazzed about working on the book again. Um, I, I'm really digging in now. And the books take a lot of time and, you know, I don't make any money and it's just, you're like, why am I doing this? And, um, and then you come up, uh, somebody's using it at a school, uh, somebody remembers the book, uh, a young person, and that's why you do it. And I'm still learning and I feel like I'm doing some good with that as with teaching. Um, so you just kind of keep going back for more, so. Yeah, that field trip yesterday was incredible. Um, so we're working on a project uh, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And at their Discovery Center, the Cooper Hewitt um, brought one of their shows, Design with the 90%. Um, so the Gates Foundation heard we were winners of this award and were like, hey, maybe you should do something for the show. So. Their idea was, oh, we should have like a digital component where guests come in and do something, and then it can live on after the exhibit. It's like, okay, real, real specific creative brief. Um, <laughs> but that was really great, because we got to come up with an idea, and the idea was to create this web platform that is essentially walks you through the design process in a really simple way, so it could be targeted to high school students, maybe even elementary school students, and you pick a topic, a social topic, and it shows you how to use design process and kind of design thinking on how to solve these and you sketch things and upload things and share things. Um, and then it also pairs it with case studies that are really powerful examples in the, in the uh, exhibition. So that's been a really fun project because we get to call all the designers that have made this amazing work and have interviews with them and talk about their process. And, uh, and then we got to make this like really fun in interface uh, for it because it was like playful, kind of fun. So when, how do we get access to this? It's going to be out soon, in the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> two or three weeks? I'm looking at our interactive director. Yeah. <laughs> Is it one of those projects where you're like, huh, how can I find an excuse to like, talk to all these amazing designers? Uh, yeah. That's a lot of our work. Yeah. <laughs> Justification for what we do. Yes. Um, my most exciting project is sitting right in front of me. She didn't expect me to call out her name. Um, this is Connie. Connie, um, can you just turn and wave? Hi, this is Connie. Uh, Connie didn't expect me to say this, but what Connie represents is she, Design for America is a national network of students um, working extracurricularly, so no grades, no pay, this is their choice to work on projects in their local community um, with a social impact. And we have 40 different universities across the campus that have studios. That number keeps on growing up. Um, and increasingly we have more and more alumni of the program. And so Connie walked up to me when I was 
de- my handling my daughter in the back. Um, I was going to say dealing with, but that didn't sound very parental. Um, anyway, yeah, handling, I, she's lovely. Handling Isabel, better. if you're out there, I love you. <laughs> I love you, babe. Um, anyway, and she, Connie walked up and she said, I just want to, I want to introduce myself again. We met a couple of years ago, but I want to tell you I'm living in San Francisco and I started the studio at MIT and um, I just wanted to say hi. And to, to feel like we are empowering uh, just people throughout, the, not just the United States, throughout the globe and have them come up and connect, not just me, with me, but with each other. So they have a community that is so powerful. And so I think the growth, the exponential growth of the, the, the family and the participants of Design for America blows my mind and makes me hopeful that we can reach that number of people we want in Congress and <laughs> the number of people we want in the medical scene, in schools, et cetera, because they're going everywhere. They're, going, they're not just going into design, they're going into all sorts of fields. And that just, I get goosebumps. Thank you, Connie. Thank Thanks you, for Connie. being here. I think- yeah, way to go. Round of applause for Connie. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so important, what you all do with that, to just design thinking and design process and yeah. just thinking about the decisions you make, even if they don't become designers, it's that, it's that thought. Yeah. And that workshop we did on Monday at Prescott, it was amazing to see these kids, yeah. like, fourth and fifth graders, like That's thinking awesome. about that, yeah. thinking about we, the decisions they're making. Will you tell them about the sign, about the clean water sign the girl made? Yes, I, her, <laughs> her approach was climate change or, and, and pollution. It was like, what was it? it was, Let's have a clean planet, a very clean planet. <laughs> it was so great. It was really cute. It was, it was really, really good. Cute. I mean, yeah, yeah I, was, I was thinking about this because um, a lot of what the work that I'm passionate about a lot of the things that the museum does, but I really love the outreach we do to schools um, and because I think it's so important for people very early in their lives to understand that they have agency as well. I mean, society owes them a lot uh, and we need to do better by, you know, kids all around the world, but actually the outcomes will only be great if they are participating in the process and in a sense, like, citizenship is the original participatory design <laughs> process, right? It is. You know, voting, being an engaged citizen, and, you know, local and, and you know, in our case, you know, federal um, politics. And I, and I think even if they don't become designers, because statistically most of them won't, at least they'll, something will click around, oh, I actually have a role to play in this, and I can be um, a part of the solution, which I think is really exciting. There was a young man in, in the fourth grade class that I was with named Che, who had a yellow mead sketch pad that he showed me and I was just blown away. And like I, you know, like I, I want to keep in touch with this kid. I can't, obviously, but, but this kid was amazing. And, and what he was documenting in his sketchbook, and that's so exciting. And you know, like you should do this for a living. And uh, so just, Spending the day and then meeting a kid like that was just so wonderful. I think it speaks to, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, the opportunities as a design community to encourage more diversity in, uh, in the design practice and kind of what that contributes to opportunities for social impact. Um, because I think it is one of the big challenges, certainly in technology, but I think more broadly in design um, if we believe that participation by designers is going to create social change, how can we encourage a much more diverse community of designers? So we host a lecture series every year, and it's through the fall to the spring, and um, we kind of market it like a rock show. You see one designer, <laughs> the tickets are free, it's at the beautifully designed Rem Cool House Library in Seattle, and Do you make really good posters now? We make really yeah. good posters. <laughs> and you get really large tote bags with tons of free stuff in them. Mm-hmm. And Design Within Reach is one of our long-term sponsors. Oh, Thank you. Uh, give a plug. <laughs> um, but um, we have secret themes every year. In the last two years, our secret theme... Wait, who, what, secret? Explain. Who knows oh, it? Like, who we're curating. Oh, and okay. our, our secret theme has been No White Men for the last two years, Um, even though we're white men. Uh, It was, um, yeah, so we're trying to champion these voices and show students and young designers and 
all designers that, hey, like, they don't have to look like um, a certain anything to be a designer. And right now, I'm really proud to say uh, Na Kim is at our gallery having an opening tonight. She's a, a South Korean designer who's amazing, and she's giving a lecture tomorrow. Oh. And um, then Ellen Lepton of the Cooper Hewitt will wrap up the season. She's great. And I think Gail's going to come next year. Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, Margaret, hey. no offense to your outfit, but when, yes, I'm going to make a fashion, fashion statement. Where is this going? Well, you're the youngest of nine. You can handle this. <laughs> When I started off in design, you had to wear, like, the designer wore black turtleneck and black glasses, which I was about to tell that story, and then I'm looking at Margaret and realizing that's what she's wearing. You're the wrong gender, but other, otherwise you look like, you're, well, it was, it was men, black, black glasses. I believe I'm the right gender, Liz. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Woo! <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, you are the right gender. Um, and I thought, oh, that's what designers are. And it was really hard getting a start, very, very hard getting a start. And one of the things that I've found, that we found in the, the founding team of Design for America and the, the people it continues to attract is the large number of, um, in particular, women we get. And um, it's, it's, in, it's shown, I'm a researcher, it's empirically shown that um, if you focus on the, the, like the cause, what you're going for, what you're trying to work for, um, you tend to attract more, you tend to attract equal numbers of men and women versus, versus more men. And I, and I just am so immensely proud. And again, the more we have, the more role models we have, and the more stories like Connie, I'm going to keep going back to Connie. Um, and, and I just think that's so incredibly important to have diverse role models. And if you don't have diverse role models, it's, it's really hard when you're starting out to be inspire, inspired and feel like you can be a part. I, I um, get people reaching out, emailing, um, saying that I am a diverse role model because person of color, woman. And uh, when that happened earlier on, I was like, well, I'm young, so I can't be a role model. And then as I've gotten older, I'm like, okay, I, I can embrace this now. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I don't know where we are. I don't know where... It's really hard to find people of color, women of yeah. color. Yeah. So you have to make the extra effort to, um, to, to find us. Uh, but it's worth it. So I'm really glad that the, kinda, the jury found you and in, uh, acknowledged all in, of your amazing but work. In, at this stage and this year, that it's still really I, it's, hard. It's ridiculous. I, I, it's, I, 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 yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Can we get? Can we model. just get a group boo on that? Yeah. <laughs> can we do that? Group boo. Yeah. One, two, three. Boo. boo. Thank you. Okay. So in just a second, <laughs> we're going to open up to <laughs> questions <laughs> from the. No boo. That we're we're going to open up to questions from all of you. There's going to be some mics around, so start queuing up uh, your questions for this illustrious panel. Um, I'm curious, in terms of whether it's design education or the design industry in general, what what are the things that you think, we just talked about diversity and I think we would probably all categorize that as something that's holding us back. In terms of social impact and the opportunity that design has, what else do you think is holding us back that we should be focused on? Can you state that? Yeah, so I think diversity is like a good example. If we had more diversity in design, I think that we would be taking on different kinds of problems. Um, we could be impacting society in, in new and different and potentially meaningful ways. I'm just curious if in like design education or in the way that designers traditionally approach, it, approach their work, are there other things that we should be encouraging people in terms of the responsibility of, of how they work? I think values. Yeah. I think the value system of design um, is a big one. We talk about it all the time at our studio. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we see with um, some of the students we teach and just people coming through the gallery, it's, it's mm -hmm. like they'll see something like a Grand Fury or they'll see a protest poster and, and they'll see our work and they're like, how do you make money doing that? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, there's money, but there's value. And, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. th that's different. Mm -hmm. And I think that is holding us back in, in some ways is our, mm. our perspective of this. And then from a other lens, on the other side of the table, it's just like, 
devaluing creativity in some ways. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you love what you do. You love yeah. to be a designer. That you sounds like just, fun. That sounds yeah. great. Do it five more times for free, you know? And it's, it's, that, <laughs> it's that type of thing. And it's like, you know, if I hired a plumber, let's say, to come to my residence, I wouldn't be like, oh, you're having a great time. Why don't you, why don't you fix the sink while you're at it? Um, you know? So I think it's value. Mm -hmm. And I want my students to be more well-rounded. I want them to read the paper. They can flip through the mm -hmm. paper on the tablet if they want, but I, I, I want them to be aware of the world and not just yeah. what's right in front of them and what's on Instagram. So I, so I have a... So Gail, I was going to say, tech, again, I'm going to bring up technology. I don't, it's like I'm tempted just in this, in this area to say that I think technology is both advancing and holding us back. I think it's advancing us because the accessibility of tools um, and connections to mentors and inspirations and portfolios and you name it is online. Um, and then I think it's holding us back because it supports a kind of toxic social comparison that to experience that at any age, especially when starting off, is too much, it's overwhelming. If you think you have to be like um, everybody else that you see, then it doesn't, I think it's, I think it's destructive to young, to young designers. Yeah, and I think, you know, tying to something that you said before, I think in particular working in high tech, I think um, if designers can uh, <laughs> get over the, uh, the mythology that any design is neutral. Yeah. Like that oh, is holding us back. Like that is. Yeah. Any. Oh, there is no such thing as neutrality in design. There's, no. <laughs> There's a, a yeah. absolutely. <laughs> There's an amazing book that just came out called The Politics of Design. And the author just escaped me, but if Maybe if the author's in the room. That, Are you in the room? Uh, no? Anybody no, know the author's no, name? No, they're from the Netherlands. Oh, she knows the name. Oh, yeah. See, you gotta ask. One more time. Ruben Painter. Yes, Payne. thank you. Can you repeat it out loud? Ruben Painter. Thank you. I might have butchered that pronunciation. Oh my gosh. She's my student. I'm so yeah. proud. <laughs> I didn't realize. Former, former student, Florence. Each Sorry. chapter is like one or two pages, <laughs> and, it, and it basically is just all, de all design is politi political. Yeah. And it shows about how design and visual communication shapes the narrative and the reality of our yeah. world. And it tries to help unlearn some of these learned things, like the map. Yeah. Oh my gosh, maps. Man, they're troublesome. Don't get us started on maps. Yeah, don't. <laughs> we already did. We could go down. We could go deep. Um, so I do want to open up questions from all of you. Uh, yes. And a rainbow. And microphones. Yeah. If you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone to you. Got one in the back Ooh. there, and we'll queue call, up. Will you call him Professor Cates, please? What's that? Doctor Cates. Professor Cates is about to ask a question. Excellent. Uh, Everyone, uh, pay attention. I'd like to know if um, Liz is planning to run for Congress, and if so, do you need a campaign manager? Barry, if it's you, I'll do it. If it's you, I'll do it. Um, yes. I feel like she'd have the best campaign posters ever, <laughs> just from this crew here who's on your side. Well, I did run for vice president of my seventh grade class, and it was something like, now I realize it's totally inappropriate, but it was something like, Lizzie, she'll get busy. Yeah, I know, it's bad. But at the time, it made a lot of sense, and I won. So, so there. Branding works. I mean, Branding works. am I right? <laughs> what other questions do you have? This is such an amazing opportunity to tap into this wisdom. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Camila. I work at Lighthouse for the Blind um, in San Francisco, and I'm not a designer per se, but... We have a design team who does a lot of like media and accessible design. And so we see this word inclusivity and accessibility and diversity thrown around a lot in design specifically. And I guess my question is like, just for me as someone who is an advocate for the disability community, like do you think that that is a trend or do you think that designers have truly taken to heart this sense of like wanting to include people who don't, who might experience experience spaces in different ways, or visual media in different ways, or et cetera. That's a great question. I hope it's not a trend. I don't but think it, it's a trend. But it feels really trendy. <laughs> I agree. Like, like 
It, it does, and um, but I hope it do, it it sticks around. Maybe it's an awakening. Maybe it's enlightenment, and um, maybe it's a movement. I think it is. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, does, I agree. You think we're sticking with trendy, it, Gail? But I think it's, it's gonna... a better design trend than illegible type. I, here's why I think. Here's what I think we've got going for us. I think the reason it's going to stick around is because it's a numbers game, and the population that is growing older and has is experiencing some of these disabilities or different. They're differently abled. Um, I think they're demanding more, and I think. I, so I do hope that it's. I sure hope it's not a trend, and I hope that the market is going to increasingly call for it. Well, and I think that we've learned that when you create accessible design, the halo effect is incredible, right? Incredible, so yeah. I think we've learned it's good business to create accessible right. good design. Business. Right. I'm, I'm hoping. Well, I think it does come back to like decision making. So if yep. you are going to make this decision, why not include as many people as you can in that decision? Um, so hopefully that just sticks and hopefully it is more. I, I also think we're going to. I think we're going to realize new things. I mean, I, I, I'm not naive. I think we're blind to many things right now, just like people used to smoke cigarettes in their car and drive with their babies in baskets. I think we're going to look back at this time and say, how in the world did we miss that differently abled person? Um, so I think we're always going to be asking this question. Yep. That's really good. Got Tim uh, back here, yeah. And please introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Tim. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hi. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about design education and uh, design for people sort of just learning about design. And, and based on the show of hands in the room, I would say maybe like 10% were students. And so I'm more curious about your advice for people more so in this room that are more versed in design. What do they need to be thinking about for the future to make it better? Ooh, I've got one. Move over. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, Figure out who's coming behind you and, and who you can elevate, who's not being noticed, and who you can elevate and how you can give them space so that they can have a space at the table. Um, because I think the greatest legacy that, um, that mentors can, can offer is creating and supporting new young people, especially people who don't look exactly like you, who didn't go to your exact school, Etc. Um, I, I think it's a, that's the name of the game is move over and elevate someone else. I think you have to do things to keep yourself stoked about this. And again, to bring up that letter from archive yesterday, that was just like, I forgot how much I love type. And just, you have to have those little moments every now and then that you're, you're just, absorbing, you know, and I, having those couple of hours there to poke around, just, yeah. Keeps, what? And, and working on the books with Steve, you know, even though there's no money or any of that, it's just, it, it keeps me fresh, it keeps me aware of what's going on in other countries. And other, so, Gail, how did you find out about Letterform Press? I'm just curious, like, how do you find places to be inspired? That's my question. Um, I don't even know how I knew about that, but... Instagram. Uh, probably Instagram. Instagram, yeah, probably Instagram. Um, so. um, but <laughs> You're to, welcome. To, to add to, like, I think it's never stop learning and just be childlike. Yeah. We were, That's like, right. kids in a candy store, yeah. like, yeah. all week. We went to the SF MoMA, yeah. and, like, we went to, we just went around, and we yeah. always just try to learn and dig in as much as you can. Yeah. And about stuff outside of design, I think you were, like, yeah. To, yeah. It's, like, as much as you can. Like, who knows? Anything that could it spark inspiration at any time, you know? And I feel like so many people just kind of like look at like other designers or all these yeah. things. It's like, oh, look at flowers. I don't know. Yeah. Just... And something I think I learned way too late was take a vacation. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, I, my gosh. Like, oh, I'm just, I've got to work. I've got to work. I've got yeah. to take a break every now and then. Um, and even, even coming here uh, for the couple days is just, just to be somewhere else and sleep somewhere else. And for me to go up to the country on the weekend sometimes. It's, it's so energizing. So, you know, whatever it is, just carve out a little time to do something fun. One last question. Got it right here. They're bringing the mic to you. Yep. Come in, come. It's like the Oprah moment. Go, go, go. Are you going to give out a free car, Margaret? Can you stand up and introduce yourself, please? <laughs> Hi, my name is Helen Maria. I am at California College of the Arts around the corner. Yay! Yay! Um, 
I guess there's a lot of design awards. Um, but this is the only national design award. Yeah. And I would love to hear from you guys, uh, what does it mean to have this platform uh. personally? And what are you going to do with it? That's a good one. OK. <laughs> I actually started a notebook about that uh, at the beginning of the year, and a special notebook that I put a leather cover on. And, uh, and I, I have a goal of one good thing every month that I'm going to do in this year. So, um, yeah, so I sort of am trying to come up with a plan and, and trying to execute that plan of taking advantage of this opportunity and paying it forward, so. We were completely shocked when I got the call. It was like, really? Is this a, am I being pranked? Okay. Like, and... Um, but it was such an honor and a validation to what we do because we've really chose to work with specific things and not do specific things. And it's always a challenge and it's always a hustle. And this was just like, keep going. It was like that like validation to keep going and keep doing what you're doing. And especially to family and friends that have to deal with the fallout of that. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, and going forward, what we want to do is just keep expanding and building on what we're doing. I mean, we want design education and uh, build on our curation, and we're actually like want to explore different mediums, like yeah. television. We have something in the works um, to, to about trying to connect design with the larger public, the broader yeah. public. And so. it's just like I feel like we're saying this, and it all sounds so corny, but. Yeah. But it's all really true. It's, you, you hit a point where it's about paying it forward and, and trying to do some good. And it just it feels really good when you do it. And, and when you see your students here, which, which I see some tonight, and to see how well they're doing, um, it's, it's so rewarding. So. so I do it for the free food. I mean, that's why I'm here. The cheese yeah. sticks. The cheese, the cheese sticks. Did you try those? They're great. Um, uh, no, I would say the way we've used the platform is really to, uh, we're a national network, and it's really to connect, raise awareness of what we're doing and connect our students with um, talented mentors and government agencies and industries in their local community. So it's been an incredible platform for raising awareness and bringing legitimacy to what we were doing. Um, there were many years in our process where people thought we were crazy, why are you doing this? I literally had somebody look at me and said, like, your apps, why, why in the hell are you starting a nonprofit? That was the, some of the first advice I, or questioning, I don't know what it was, um, that I got. And so it was real validation, I think, uh, that we're onto something. I think the other thing is that we're starting to hear about design for China and design for Turkey. And so that is really, to me, um, that's just so, so I, you know, Let's go beyond Congress. Let's go to the model UN. Like, let's get to UN, like United Nations. Let's go for 50% designers there. Um, I think that would be amazing. So um, as an outro, because that's one of my favorite words, an outro. Yes, outro. Um, I would love to, uh, as a way to kind of reflect on the wisdom that you all have collected over the years in developing these amazing careers, um, what's advice that you would give your 16-year-old self? And uh, I'll start by saying, um, I would tell my 16-year-old self, you are not nearly as flaky as your family thinks you are. <laughs> and that it's all going to work out. <laughs> Stumper. Yeah. Stop Stumper. overthinking I know, everything. I know. That's yeah, all, yeah, just, what is it, Gail? Oh, stop overthinking stop everything. Overthinking. Stop moping around. That's what I would say. Start moving. It'll be fine. I would have told myself to get a travel abroad exchange student situation and, and uh, see more of the world at a younger age. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That would, yeah. Have, that would have been more fun. Well, how do you think that would have, I mean, is, is it basically just kind of the obvious, like, broadening your perspective or? Well, I think... In my specific case, I grew up in a town of 3,000 people in a cornfield in the middle of America. So if I would have went from that straight to Hong Kong, I think it would have just reconfigured my brain completely. I went from there to Chicago, which was, you know, a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. I think mine is similar to Michael's, which is get out of Dodge. Um, Dodge refers to the place that you're living that is the same old, same old. Um, when I was 16, 
I finally remember going to my history teacher and really apologetically asking if it was okay if I missed two weeks of school because my family was going to be, had the rare, rare privilege of going to our sister city in Russia at the time to deliver medical equipment. And um, I remember, I was very apologetic. Like, I know I'm going to miss this, this part and this part. And he looked at me and he's like, are you kid You are going to, Russia had just opened, right? Like, you could, it, nobody had been there before um, from outside. And he said, you're going to experience history when you're there. Do not worry about the two weeks um, you will miss in class. And I think I have found that um, even as my work gets more and more intense uh, and I have more and more responsibilities, um, saying yes to opportunities that blow my mind and make me th and help me think differently is always invaluable. So get out of Dodge is my advice to a 16-year-old. <laughs> well, it's a great note to end on is to remind ourselves to shake things up like take some scary things on. We don't quite know if we know how to do it. Um, and uh, I think when we get further in our career, as Tim was saying, it's like, it's to challenge yourself, never stop learning. And it's really inspiring to hear the ways in which you all are doing that and that you've inspired so many other designers in the work that you do. So thanks so much. Congratulations on this huge award. And uh, um, thanks everybody for being here and the wonderful engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret.